I'm Richard Lee from the Hall Institute of Public Policy, and welcome to the Hall Institute Public Forum. This is part of our special New Jersey Media Landscape Series. We're taking a look at the journalism industry, where we are, how we got there, and kind of where we're going. And part of, um, I guess, where we are now and, you know, maybe a wave of the future is something called hyperlocal news sites. And with me today is the um, man who runs one of the more successful hyperlocal you know, news sites, thealternativepress.com. That's Michael Shapiro. Mike, uh, thanks for joining us. Here. Great to be here, Rich. Okay. Um, I guess sometimes in any industry, people throw buzzwords around and you see hyperlocals and you know, sometimes you forget that people who are not familiar with journalism might not know what they are. So you can spend a minute or two explain what a hi hyperlocal news site is. Yeah, well, basically, it's a news site that covers uh, news and information in a specific town or geographic area, um, and, and it's kind of a, a niche, uh, meaning that they cover everything going on in that particular town. Um, so, for example, at thealternativepress.com, we cover everything from town council to high school sports and everything in between. And uh, that's typical of hyperlocal news sites in New Jersey and beyond. Okay, so is it kind of similar to what traditionally has been like weekly or community print newspapers in New Jersey and elsewhere, but you're doing it online? Correct. It's online and it's also, they, they tend to be 24-7 news operations, mm -hmm. whereas instead of having a, a weekly newspaper where it would come out once a week, you know, we cover things as they're happening mm -hmm. in our town. So, for example, you don't have to wait a week to find out that, you know, the high school football team won the game. Yeah. You find out minutes after the game took place and there's a nice story up with photos and, right. you know, interview with the coach and, and the whole nine yards. Yeah, we live in a world today where people want their news instantaneously and, you know, that's what happens. Tell me um, a little bit, I mean, we've worked together, so I'm familiar with thealternativepress.com, but for people who are not, um, you know, tell us about, you know, your, your news site, the towns you cover. Sure, Rich. Um, well, basically, I, I started thealternativepress.com with my wife about two and a half years ago, and uh, I, I was actually, I was, um, I was born in Livingston, we live in New Providence, and uh, I had always been really involved in the community, but I couldn't be because I was a, an attorney in New York, and I was commuting back and forth to the city, working like 15 hours a day, and uh, I thought that was going to be my lot in life, so to speak, and, um, and then when my son was a year old, um, we found out that he needed open heart surgery and thankfully everything's fine. He's now four, but it really made me rethink everything. And I said, you know, what could I do that would really help the community where I could do something I'd really like to do and I could actually see my wife and son. And so we came up with this concept of an all online hyper local daily newspaper. And when we launched, we were basically the first in the state. We launched in Summit, New Providence in Berkeley Heights in October of 2008. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then, you know, since then, we're now in 14 towns. Uh, we're accredited by the New Jersey Press Association. Uh, we had almost 400,000 people come to the site last year. Uh, we have um, about 200 paid freelance reporters on staff, um, 30 columnists, and a five-member sales team. Uh, and, um, and now hyperlocal news sites have, have sprouted up right, all over. Yeah you know, New Jersey and beyond. So we were kind of, uh, we were one of the first, but we still are, uh, you know, at the cutting edge of what we're doing here. Yeah, well, let's go back to, to when you started it. What gave you the idea to do something like this? Because as you said, now there are hyperlocal sites all over, America Online's involved, some other large places, but it was a relatively new concept when you started it. What gave you the idea and why did you think it, it might catch on? Well, you know, I had, um, I had written, you know, a public policy column for about, uh, at that time, about seven years, mm -hmm. um, first for Politic or NJ and then for the Hall Institute. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I was up on public policy and things like that. And I had been a um, reporter in, in, in high school and college. So I had, a, you know, a little bit of a journalism background and I was also a news junkie. And, you know, I kind of looked around and I said, you know, why should people have to wait a week to find out that there's a burglar on the loose in their neighborhood? Um, and, you know, how, how can we create something that would really be of help to a lot of people? And, um, and also, I think, you know, uh, part of it was creating an objective online local newspaper. You know, the newspapers that I've grown up with um, oftentimes are not objective right. um, or they have an editorial page and it's and it seeps into the news coverage mm -hmm. and with the alternativepress.com we don't have an editorial page people can write letters to the editor they can write guest columns but you'll never hear from me how to vote or what to think you know our philosophy is if you give people objective nonpartisan news and information you know they can make up their own minds they don't need me telling them how to vote or what to think and this is a real big change um, particularly on the local level, um, where, you know, people are just accustomed to opening up their local newspaper and, you know, they're, um, they, they're reading news that is biased in some way. 
Um, with us, you don't have that, which I think is, is really good. Um, and then I think a part of it too is, is the idea of uh, kind of going back to the roots of a newspaper itself, of educating the public and serving the community. And as newspapers have shrunk in terms of size because of uh, publication costs and all kinds of things like that, um, they've cut back on what they're able to do for the community. So, for example, I'm in Rotary in Berkeley Heights, and you know, if we want a meeting announcement in the local paper, you know, oftentimes we have to pay money right. to get a meeting announcement in there. Uh, with the AlternativePress.com, organizations, businesses, residents can get the word out about their events, their organizations, etc., um, and you know, for free. And it's a vehicle for them to, to get the word out about what they do. And it's our way of giving back to the community um, to be able to serve all these different folks. And what's happened as a result of that is it's built up a lot of readership. It's created a lot of good karma. And, um, and it's really gotten the word out about us to, to the organizations, the businesses. And I think that's one of the reasons we've been so successful. Uh, you know, we have about 100 paid advertisers on the site, which is basically more than any other hyperlocal out there. And I think, you know, one of the reasons for it is because we're truly serving the community and we provide vehicles for people to get the word out about what they're doing without somebody having a handout asking for advertising right. dollars. Yeah. yeah. Let me um, kind of follow up on that. I think you've um, answered somewhat. I'm, I'm curious as to why hyperlocal sites are so popular, like why you think with all the information out there on, on the web that people can get today, people still love to go to these, you know, sites, read about what's happening in, in their community. Um, and the second part of the question is, you know, why in particular has the alternative press.com succeeded? You know, I always make the point that a lot of the hyper locals draw large audiences, but aren't really making a profit. And here, you know, you've, you know, quit your job as an attorney, you've got a successful operation. So maybe, you know, in general, why are they popular? And then second part of the question, you know, what sets you guys apart? Well, I think for one, uh, you know, local newspapers, the hard copy newspapers, have really cut back on their coverage. Um, you know, in fact, the, uh, the the newspaper that covers New Providence, um, they're no longer covering all the government meetings going on in the town. Um, and you know, people really want to know what's going on in their town. They want to know what the town council is up to and the board of education. They want to know. Um, they want to be able to read about the high school sporting teams and what's taking place with them. Uh, and you know, the local newspapers, um, because of the costs involved and because people are going more and more online for their news, uh, they don't have the resources to cover the news the way they used to. They don't have the advertising to support it. And so, you know, with the alternative press, one, we have unlimited space. Okay. Second, we don't have the, um, the publishing costs. We don't have the distribution costs that a traditional newspaper has. So by doing that, uh, by, uh, uh, because of those factors, we're able to provide all, tons of coverage. Um, the information people want, we're able to create um, the ability for everybody to submit these press releases and write these letters to the editor. There's no word limit, no deadline. Um, where, whereas in a local paper, you know, you're cabin to 150 words. With us, there's no word limit, no deadline. Um, and, um, and because of that, you know, and because of our cost structure, we're able to offer advertising at a fraction of the cost of a hard copy newspaper. And it's trackable. You know, in a, in a um, hard copy newspaper, you have no idea how many people saw your ad. Mm -hmm. um, with us, we know how many people clicked on your ad, how many people viewed your page. So there's accountability right. with that. And then in addition, you know, it helps with, your, with businesses' uh, search engine optimization. It helps people find them on the internet. It helps with their branding. Whereas, you know, with a traditional print ad, you know, you have no idea how many people are seeing it, but second, it does nothing for you in terms of internet exposure. And so for, for those reasons, I think that the, the, advertising side of it makes a lot of sense. And I think one of the reasons you know, in terms of why we're successful, one is is that we don't have a big bureaucracy. Um, we're truly local. Everyone involved are all local residents. Our reporters, our columnists, our salespeople, you know, all of us are all local residents in these towns that we cover. And because of that, we ha we're really ingrained in the community. I think that's really important. The second thing that I think is a key to our success is the passion that we have for what we do. Um, you know, when when we were starting and, and even now, I mean, I, I put in 20 hour work right. days um, and I'm make, certainly making a lot less than I was making as a lawyer. There's not too many people out there that, you know, would necessarily do that. But but second is the passion I have for what we're doing. And yeah, it's 20 hours a day, but you enjoy what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. And that and that passion is infectious and mm -hmm. people see that are you know people that I, you know I talk to about advertising people who I talk to about becoming reporters for us they see that and they want to become a part of it mm -hmm. um, and I think the you know the third thing is is that people recognize we're truly serving the community you know, we're out there helping people every day um, and and that's I think another key to our success is that we, we truly that's our mission mm -hmm. and um, 
the corollary of that is because we are doing that for so many people, we've built up this large readership that we can then sell to advertisers because they're interested in reaching all these people that are coming to our site. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as you said, I guess at the outset of your remarks, you are kind of filling some of the gap that was created by the downturn in, in traditional media. And I know when I look at what's happening in the industry, you see you know, cutbacks, layoffs, but you also see things like your organization and other places that are finding new ways to get news and information to people. So. Yeah, and, 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 and that's interesting because, you know, and I think, so we're filling that, that void that's mm. taking place, and I see that as, as, um, as increasing in the years to come, meaning that more and more local papers and also I think larger newspapers are going to be cutting back their right. coverage. And so sites like ours, where we're able to provide that coverage and provide it faster, um, usually provide it um, more thoroughly and less expensively, is is a benefit to the reader. It's a benefit to the cons you know to the consumer. It's also a benefit to the advertiser, and um, and we're we're helping people at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned that at the beginning, even before you got into the alternative press.com, you were a news junkie. And I want to talk a little bit about what's happening um, in the industry, just just in general, in you know the time that you've been following the news or involved in, in running a, a news outlet. And what are some of the major changes you've seen? You know, obviously, we know the trend is more and more people are getting their news online. But you know, beyond that, what are some of the implications of what's happened? Well, I mean, I, I see this a lot, and um, it's something that we really resist at the alternativepress.com is this tendency for news outlets to become sensationalized, mm -hmm. um, where, you know, they're trying to put out, you know, the hardest hitting headline, or they're trying to concentrate their com you know, their coverage on who's been shot today. Yeah, because that, um, that draws people to websites, even yeah. some... I read recently, like the Washington Post was getting stuff into headlines, just certain words so that they knew they would attract viewers. Yeah, and also a lot of these sites, uh, you know, including a lot of hyper-local sites, um, you know, they rely on uh, anonymous comments from readers mm -hmm. who, you know, and there's really no accountability. Um, so, you know, the people are going on these sites and posting, you know, uh, nasty things about people mm -hmm. and stuff like that, and that draws readership. Mm -hmm. But you know, at the alternativepress.com, that's not what we believe in. I mean, mm -hmm. when my wife and I started this, we wanted it to be a family friendly website where, you know, a parent doesn't have to worry about their kindergartner going on mm -hmm. the site and reading everything. They don't have to worry about that. So, you know, we don't have comments or anonymous comments. People can write letters to the editor, they can write guest columns, so there's opportunities for them to express themselves, but they have to put their name to it and they have to be held accountable for what they say. Um, but I think, in terms of the news industry in, in itself, you know, I see a kind of a race to the bottom mm -hmm. where uh, all these different news outlets are trying to put out the most um, kind of scandalous news or the most eye-catching news mm -hmm. to try to draw this readership. Um, but we don't play that game. I mean, we, 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 we call it objectively. Um, we don't sensationalize our headlines. Um, that's not what we're about. You know, I think it's kind of like the difference between being, you know, the New York Times and the New York Post. Mm -hmm. We're not the New York Post. Yeah. You know, we try to be kind of times-ish on the local level. That's what we aspire to do. Uh, you know, Is it difficult to resist that, like you know, knowing that like, if you just you know, snuck a word into a headline or something like that, it would you know, boost your readership and in turn make, you know, boost your ability to get advertisers? And Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a challenge. And um, I, you know, we've had other situations, for example, where you know, it's my belief that you should put out um, the best story you can. And if that means that the story doesn't necessarily come out first, mm -hmm. that's okay. Yeah. And we've had situations where we've been accused of covering up, for example, there was a, a murder in Summit um, last summer. Mm -hmm. And um, and we were working on the story, but one of the hyper locals, the AOL one, you know, they came out and they had the, the story about this guy being murdered. And, you know, and there was CBS, for example, and other um, news outlets were going door to door saying to people things like, hey, you know, do we have a, is there a gang problem in mm -hmm. Summit, you know? And that was the headline. Yeah. It turns out there was no gang involved at all. And we, when we put out our story, yeah, you know, we made that clear right from the mm -hmm. get-go. We didn't sensationalize it, and we actually reported it objectively and factually. Our story came out like a day and a half after the first story broke. I got emails and calls from people before that story, our mm -hmm. story came out, saying, "Are you trying to cover mm -hmm. this up? You know, why are you not putting this out?" And, all, and my response was, "Well, we're trying to do a thorough, good job on this story, and that to me is more important. This is a serious thing. We're not going to make, you know." accusations we're not going to you know create rumors or anything we want to report this accurately because it's a really important story yeah ultimately i mean what do you think the public wants do you think that they want to wait and see you know the story and an accurate story as it was in this case or you know it's kind of like a what came first the chicken or the egg do they want to you know just get the information right away even if maybe all the details aren't there or if, you know it's 
promoted a certain way, like with gangs or something like that? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on what the story is. Uh, you know, and I, I think that, that people are willing to wait. Are they willing to wait a week? No. Mm -hmm. But if you have it out pretty quickly, yeah. I think that people are willing to wait. I mean, there are a lot of people that tell me, you know, um, for example, you know, we cover some some different government meetings and once in a while, you know, our coverage is not out right after the meeting is over. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of people who tell me they really appreciate that because when they come to us, our, what we're providing is credible and what we're providing they can rely on. And that's, I think, a real key function of the media um, is to, to be, to pro is to be providing you know, objective, credible news and information to people and not functioning on rumors. Yeah. And th and that to me is not news. That's gossip. That's a blog. That's not what we do. Um, and you know, and I think that when you're looking at um, journalism today, I think that, um, and we've talked a little bit about this race to the bottom, but you know, I, I think what that also creates is, is that um, a tendency, and you're, you're seeing this on the, even the national networks, um, where they're not really covering the news the way it should be covered, or they have a, a slant that's becoming more and more visible. Mm -hmm. um, and you know you see that obviously with networks um, like for example Fox and mm -hmm. on also on the left you right. see that as well and um, and to me you know I think what the American people are looking for are you know objective news sources that they can rely on that information you, you, of course you're always going to have people on the left or the right that are going to gravitate mm -hmm. towards a particular news source but if you're there and day in and day out doing the right thing I think that people respect that and that you know uh, and there's an audience for that. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's like a lot of things that people to the extremes, to the left, to the right, you know, have their, their markets and there's stations and news outlets that cater to them. But, you know, hopefully the vast majority of, you know, citizens, you know, are kind of in the middle and want to get objective information so they can make up their minds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which um, kind of leads to a question I've been asking, you know, a number of the people I've had as guests on these shows is, you know, thinking about all the changes that have taken place in the media industry, you know, the you know, downturn on one side, you know, less reporters, less staff, less resources, making it more difficult for news outlets to cover the news. And on the other hand, the rise of internet and online news sources. Um, ultimately, do you think the, the public is better um, informed today or less informed than they were, say, 10, 15 years ago before the internet was what it is today? It's interesting. I think that they are more informed, but not better informed. Right. Yeah. Meaning that there's so many different sources of information now mm -hmm. um, that you know there there's much more information out there, but the information isn't the level of quality that you'd like to see out there. I mean, I I, I always refer to the um, even hyperlocal as the as the wild west of, mm -hmm. of of news because you know you a hyperlocal the alternatepress.com for example is very different than another hyperlocal that you might come in contact with mm -hmm. um, you know where we're accredited by the New Jersey Press Association we have you know paid freelance reporters who are reporting the news objectively you might go on another hyperlocal and it's really somebody's opinion and they're mm -hmm. just kind of spewing venom at the local officials in yeah. a town so you know what you get out there and so i think that there's a lot of um weeding out and that's starting to take place i mean there's a number of hyper locals that have closed um there are a number that are in, in trouble um and there's a number of new ones that are forming and and i think that you know it's it's uh not not necessarily a survival of the fittest argument but i think that you know right now the reader has to do a little bit more work than they used to have to do um meaning that they have to be careful about what they're reading and uh and make sure that it is a credible news source um rather than some some gossip rag that they're now going to you know adopt as oh my god this is really happening um so i think that there's more work that needs to be done on the part of citizens right. to weed through these various news sources so, uh, but at the end of the day, there's more information, but the information is not necessarily as good as it used to be. Yeah, that's what one of the points that I make in some, some of my research is that, um, you know, there is so much information out there today, but it's put more responsibility on all of us to weed out, you know, what's credible and what's non-credible. And unfortunately, not everybody does that. Some right. people get sucked in by the non-credible ones. Uh, another important, you know, function of the media always has been to hold government accountable. And, you know, kind of in that same time span, uh, I'd be interested to get your thoughts on what's happened because sometimes I think that because of the internet, government agencies, and it's not just government, it's anyone powerful, a corporation, now has the ability to get their message out directly to people. They don't need to go through the filter of the news media. They don't have, need to put out a press release or hold a press conference and go through the scrutiny that a journalist you know, would place you know, the information through. If you're a candidate, you can put up 
your information right on your website. You can email it directly to people. You can use social networks. So, you know, in light of that, do you think government is being held less accountable today, you know, by the media than it was in the past? Well, I think it's being held less accountable, um, mostly because the resources aren't out there to cover and do investigative reporting. Uh, you know, I think that that used to be a mainstay of the newspaper business, and um, and now it's not. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, and I find that challenge even on the local mm -hmm. level. Uh, where you know you want to, and anytime we find out, you know, that there might be something going on, we always look into it. Um, but at the same time, you know, is it a focus of what we're doing? No. Um, but you know, it, anytime we hear of anything that possibly could be going wrong or some corruption or any possible corruption, you know, I always put a reporter on it. We always look into it, and you know, nine times out of ten, you know, in our towns, a lot of times it turns out to be nothing. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, it turns yeah, out to be something, and we report on it. Um, but you know, I think that um, I, I, I think that that's that's one of the key things. I, I think that. You know, government tends to get a pass um, unless uh, you know it's a media outlet that has a certain objective, um, and you've seen this, for example, with um, with uh, with you know Breitbart and stuff like right, that, yeah. with Anthony Weiner and and these kinds of things, where you know if there's um, you know if a media outlet is is looking to to do a certain thing, they're able to do it if they devote the resources to it, then they can then they can really expose something mm -hmm. that people might not have otherwise you know known about. Yeah. Um, but generally, I think that there's less resources devoted to investigative journalism, and as a result, there's probably, um, to, to some degree, more corruption going on than we would, than we know about. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I think that there's laws that have been put in place and right. that have helped to um, to reduce corruption, mm -hmm. and so I think it's kind of a balance of those two things. Yeah. Um, but without those laws in place, I think that there would be. Um, a lot more corruption going on because yeah. there's the news media is not really there to be the watchdog anymore. Right, and there's been studies, maybe not in the U.S., but in other countries that, that kind of show a direct relationship between you know the size and the scrutiny of the media and the level of corruption there. Mm -hmm. So, um, one of the other things that I want to talk about is a process called um, agenda setting, and it goes back to some studies that were done. I think back in the '70s that more or less concluded that what the press chose to write about really set the agenda for public policy, for what citizens were interested in. Um, and a number of studies kind of backed that up or have backed it up over the years. But I'm wondering if that's you know changing because of the way changes in the way people get news today. Um, you know, well, first of all, I mean, do you buy the argument that you know the press was the agenda setter? And you know, is that still the case? Well, I mean, I think that I would expand it a little bit. Right. I would say that the press and social media mm -hmm. are the agenda centers, um, and and you look at that. For example, the um, the debt ceiling. Mm -hmm. How many Americans would have any idea what a debt ceiling was, or think it was in any way important if the media wasn't reporting on it literally every night? Mm -hmm. and, and they've been doing it now for about two weeks. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's helped to set the agenda in Washington because by putting so much attention on it, everybody is thinking and talking about the mm -hmm. debt ceiling. I mean, this is something that, you know, has been going on for, for many, many years, but this year, this time, it's now a big issue right. because the media has made it a big issue. And now it looks like maybe there's going to be something actually done about mm -hmm. it. So I think that, you know, that in, in large measure, the media does still set the agenda, but I would just add to that that Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, are now contributing to that agenda as well. Um, you know, from even the Anthony Weiner thing mm -hmm. to um, what's happened recently with Rupert Murdoch with the hacking and the, and all of, of this other stuff. You know, it's come to light in many way, in many respects because of social media mm -hmm. um, that then the mainstream media or non not so mainstream media have picked up yeah, on yeah. and then done stories about. Um, I, I still think that the media slash social media yeah. are, are at the at the forefront of setting the agenda in terms yeah. of what we're talking about. Right. You think that's the case here in New Jersey? And I'm thinking for you know, research I'm looking at, I'm looking at our last two gubernatorial elections and there were a lot of changes in what was available between 05 and 09. Do you see a change in that time span? Well, I mean, I was kind of surprised in terms of uh, you know the last gubernatorial election. I mean, there didn't seem to be as much coverage right. and people yeah, didn't know where people, you know, these candidates stood. And I think that's a measure of, um, the uh, what we were talking about before mm -hmm. about these newsrooms pulling back mm -hmm. and not doing the kind of level of coverage that needs to be done, um, and and I think that that's a function of that. Um, I think that the media in New Jersey still tend to 
set the agenda of what's taking place. But I think in New Jersey in particular, I think, you know, the star ledger has become pretty weak. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think because of that, and I don't like to see that happen. I think yeah. we need a really vibrant, strong state newspaper because you want that watchdog function right. and you want that newspaper to be helping to set the agenda. And I think in large measure in New Jersey, what's wound up happening is, is that star ledger's kind of taken a back seat mm -hmm. and that's enabled you know, some of the politicians to more set the agenda or, you know, some of these um, other sites like Politicker and stuff mm -hmm. like that to set the agenda in Trenton um, rather than uh, rather than the traditional news media. Right. How about the alternative press.com? Are there times when you think you've set the agenda? I know in the past we've talked, I don't know if it's actually agenda setting, but, you know, some stories that really, you know, got some, you know, wider attention. And there was one in Melbourne, I think you've mentioned. Yeah. That. And there was one recently, um, we actually, and it's not one of our towns, but uh, in Warren, there's an aquatic center uh -huh. uh, that is, um, you know, thought to be built there. And we actually um, uncovered that um, part of it is actually in Berkeley Heights and, and, possibly could fall before the Berkeley Heights zoning board and all these Berkeley Heights residents are now coming out to the town council meetings demanding that things are done about it because they're worried about traffic and things like that. Um, and not to say our story by itself caused this, right. but I think that, you know, the fact that we looked into it when a resident mentioned it to mm -hmm. us and we did this story that nobody else did at the time, that's helped to uh, bring the issue to the forefront. And I think that this happens quite frequently, um, you know, uh, in, in, in our towns uh, where, you know, we're the first to break a mm -hmm. particular news item and, uh, and then that becomes kind of like the talk of the town. Yeah. So, and um, how do you, you know, make sure that what you're writing about is what people are interested in or is that just kind of like a sixth sense or something that journalists have well i don't know i mean i think that probably um i you know when i assign stories and stuff you know i want us every week where we cover every town council meeting and every board of education meeting and every zoning or planning board meeting that is not purely residential mm -hmm. that's automatic we do that every single week sometimes they're interesting and sometimes they're not uh -huh. but we report on them um i'm not so much interested in oh is this story going to be of interest to people that to me is us serving the community mm -hmm. that's us doing our job as a newspaper um i think that you know other stories like for example you know some of the events that we'll cover and whatever those i kind of pick and choose and i say okay you know would people be interested in reading about this and i know for example from the past that um you know there, there's a feast at, at uh, of mount carmel in berkeley heights mm -hmm. and uh that's an event that everybody wants to know mm -hmm. when it's taking place and whatever. And usually nobody tells people when mm -hmm. it's taking place. So, you know, like we're doing a preview article now about that. And, you know, I'm sure just like last year, the story is going to get, you know, a thousand people are going to read that yeah. story. Um, and so, you know, that's one where I said, hey, you know what, let's make sure that's to right. do an article because I know people want to know about it. Um, it was interesting because this year um, we didn't cover um, the um, and it was mostly because I, I just it just slipped my mind, but we didn't cover the um, the Livingston Kiwanis Club. They do this this um, carnival in Livingston, which is a tradition there, and um, we had a thousand people who came and read last year's article about the carnival, and they thought it was on a different day because oh, the days have changed. I guess it's one of the dangers you have to remember about the internet. Yeah. The article is still out there. <laughs> yeah, but it said to me, man, we got to cover that next yeah. year because there's you know probably a lot of people pissed off about yeah. that. So. Uh, I think we just have a few minutes left, but uh, tell me what's in store for the AlternativePress.com. You, you've grown tremendously already, and, but I, I know you, you're, you're not sitting still. You've got a bunch of other irons in the fire. What, yeah. yeah, well, I mean, recently our, we, we licensed the site uh, for the first time in Patterson. and uh, Patterson, They won a number of awards, too. Didn't yeah, PattersonPress.com just won uh, you know, Best Online News Site by the New Jersey Press Association. Okay. And one of the things we're looking to do at the Alternative Press is um, license the site to people that want to start um, the Alternative Press in their own town as their own business, just like my wife and I did. Yeah. You know, we call it you know, an incubator of entrepreneurship. Uh, and it's a great way to, to expand the alternative press while keeping it local without creating a big bureaucracy. So that's what I'm going to be really working on over the next year or two and beyond uh, as we move forward. Um, but that's where I really want us to, to, to take this. I mean, it could really go anywhere in the state uh, providing this kind of high quality, objective daily local news for people. So, okay. Well, lots of luck with that. And thanks for spending some time to talk with us today and sharing your thoughts on hyperlocals, the journalism industry, and um, a few other things. Well, thank you very much, Rich. Okay. Uh, this is Richard Lee from the Hall Institute of Public Policy. You've been watching the Hall Institute Public Forum. My guest has been Michael Shapiro of the AlternativePress.com. Thanks for watching. Please join us again next time.